could pass for brother. All right. <laughs> well, I think, I think we're live. So good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to those who are here, and welcome to those who are present digitally. Uh, great to, to have everyone here. Uh, my name is Father Kyle Kilpatrick. I'm the associate pastor at St. Francis de Sales in Holland. Um, I've been there for about nine or ten months now. I was just ordained last June, and I've been at Holland pretty much ever since then. So it's been been great. Uh, so, i um, grateful to Paolo for inviting me out tonight, or for, for this Thursday and for next Thursday as well, um, to do a little series on religion and science, and <clears throat> especially the supposed conflict which exists between the two. Um, I, I, I went to Grand Valley before I entered the seminary and actually studied cell and molecular biology there, so science and religion are two things that are both very close to my heart, and uh, which I have a, a deep appreciation for. So uh, it actually saddens me, saddens me a lot to, to hear a lot of the rhetoric that's out there, just as much in the religious world as in the secular world, um, about this conflict between science and religion. So I'm answering the question on, that's on the board already, saying there's no conflict. But uh, we're going to dig in a little bit into why that's the case as we, as we go through here. Uh, I'd like to begin in prayer, if we could. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you for the universe which you've created and all the wonders it contains. Thank you for the gift of understanding, for our intellect by which we come to know these, these great mysteries and we can marvel at everything that you've created. Lord, we pray for deeper understanding of the world in which you have placed us. And that through our understanding of everything that you've created, we might arrive at a deeper understanding of the Creator. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, so before we dig in too deeply, I'm curious if, if you all wouldn't mind saying briefly, um, what is it that brought you here, or what is it that kind of caught your fancy? Um, I know science, some people, as soon as they graduated from high school, said, Man, I'm glad I never have to talk about that again. Um, but so, if you want, some of you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, um, I have a son who's a geologist, and he's agnostic. And we get into discussions about science and religion. He said, "I can't prove that there's a God, so therefore I can't believe in him." So okay. I came to Great. see what the conflict is, and maybe get something to argue more with. <laughs> Great. Okay. Awesome. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, or if you've got a science background, maybe. Or I, 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 I enjoy coming to these presentations and when I'm <coughs> able to and to learn more. And and I heard you speak before. I mean, I've heard Paolo, and I, I want to learn more. Great. Glad to have you here. Thank you. I'm a retired teacher, and I taught um, little ones, but there's such a focus now on <coughs> STEM. Uh, yeah. learning for children and how important that is and and yet wanting to keep the, the, um, <coughs> the faith part of it as well and I didn't see a conflict and I don't understand uh, we have a, a daughter who's a pharmacist and we watch the Big Bang Theory right? yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah even that I, I, we watch this is very we watch the young Sheldon and even in that show he says he doesn't believe in God and that kind of bothers me a bit that as a little kid they have that as part of the show he doesn't have any faith or belief sure. in God so okay yeah. um, I'm here uh, because um, I often have discussions with my wife who is a very staunch Catholic and um, we often end up on different sides of the discussion based on faith versus reason. It's, I guess, somewhat similar to yeah, science very much similar, versus yeah. religion. Yeah. So, again, that's why I'm here, to see if I can yeah. best her in a discussion. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to fill up your arsenal a little bit, huh? Okay. There's a great encyclical by uh, John Paul II called Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason. So that might, might be something you'd be interested in checking out as well. But. Cool. Okay. Good. Well, thank you. Um, and hold on to those questions. I'm, I'm sorry, what was your name? You said your son was a geologist? Gloria. Gloria. Okay, yeah. Um, great. 
Thank you for that. Your son is um, not uncommon. That's a, it's actually quite a common perspective uh, in the world that we live in. So that's one of the one of the questions that we want to start to look at. Um, it is a problem. Um, just my own experience studying uh, biology in college. There was just a lot of kind of dismissive rhetoric, almost like, yeah, you're sort of one of those ignorant people if you still believe in God and, and, uh, and this, this thing that we can't prove or we have no real concrete evidence for. Um, and that really saddened me because my own experience of studying uh, science, especially cell and molecular, the really small, intricate stuff was, dang, this is amazing. Like this, if this all happened by accident, this is, this is some accident. So uh, I, I, I found the study of science to be something that really drew me into, uh, into a deeper sense of wonder at the universe that God had created. Um, but that's not always the experience that everyone has. So uh, I actually want to take a look at, I don't know how well you all can see that from the back, but um, some studies that were done, I believe these were in 2012, it seems, if I'm not mistaken, but pretty recently. Um, just asking two questions. Are science and religion often in con conflict? And then personally, does science sometimes conflict with your own religious beliefs? And you see a lot of... Uh, how those percentages break down for whoops, for folks of different um, looks like it doesn't want me to use the laser pointer. Okay, <laughs> for folks of different um, Christian denominations or unaffiliated. But I think what's really telling actually is these these two bottom sections. Um, they they broke those questions down based on how often you attend church. So right here it says um, for those who attend church every week, it's pretty much 50-50, 48% to 45% um, that are science and religion often in conflict. And the less frequently you <coughs> attend church, the more likely you are to say that yes, they are in conflict. Now on the other side, does science conflict with your own religious beliefs, personally? Uh, the more, pretty much the same for those who attend church every week, but then as you go down, the less frequently you attend church, the less likely you are to say that those things are in conflict. There might be different ways of interpreting that, but what seems to be the case to me based on this data and based on my own experience and conversations with people is the reason that folks who don't go to church as often don't have conflicts in their own personal beliefs between science and religion is because they don't really have any strongly held religious beliefs. Uh, maybe there's a vague sense of God or, or his existence, but any time that even appears to conflict with science, there's a, a, a willingness to jettison that belief for give me concrete, hard evidence, something I can prove, right, um, in the physical, kind of tangible way. So Catholics fare a little bit better than some other denominations, but actually not, not all that much here um, in the breakdown of these. So pretty interesting data. Uh, but I think what this indicates is that this is a really significant obstacle in my own experience, it's certainly the case amongst young people especially, that this perceived conflict between science and religion, between uh, what the Bible teaches about the universe and what science teaches about the universe is a major obstacle to evangelization in the modern world. And it's a major thing that makes Christianity seem not credible um, to modern ears. So, that's enough of that. Uh, this, is, this is asking more specifically the question about the evolution of humans and other living beings, whether that happened by a natural process, or was guided over time by, by God, or um, things have existed in their present form since the beginning of time. Uh, it's interesting, we don't need to go in, into depth about these numbers, but again, you see the same thing that um, more frequent um, church attendance, you have much more high probability of people saying that organisms are in their present form since the beginning of time, evolution's a crock, there's nothing's changed, uh, and then as people, as church attendance goes down, people are more likely to say, yeah, no, they, things evolved, organisms evolved according to a natural process, of course. <clears throat> We're going to get more into that specifically next week, actually. Paul is going to talk about um, the theology of creation and evolution and how, how those things fit together. 
But again, this is one of the primary places that this perceived conflict uh, between science and religion comes up. So, <clears throat> what I want to do mainly tonight is talk about um, what is science and what is religion. If we're going to talk about are these things in conflict, it's good to define our terms. And especially to look at their respective epistemologies or the way that we know things, the way that we know things according to the method, methods of science, the way that we know things according to religion, what kinds of things can we know? Um, are they completely separ separate? Is there any congruency between those two things? How are we to understand this? So beginning with science. Uh, science comes from scientia, it's just a Latin word for knowledge, which meant knowledge broadly, um, but has come more recently to mean only the things that I can systematically know through repeated observation. Things in the physical and material world, knowledge that can be gained through observation uh, and experimentation according to the scientific method, which we're all familiar with from probably sixth grade or whatever, right? Uh, this is lots of ways of defining the specifics of this, but this is the basic process that by which we come to know things uh, in the scientific world, scientific methods. So um, it's important to note that it's circular and ongoing. So development of theories, make observations, ask questions based on that, uh, formulate a hypothesis, study, gather data, and then based on the data, based on what we've observed, uh, through the interactions, through the experiments that we've set up in, in the material world, then we can revise those and see if, if they need to change, and we, we arrive at a deeper understanding. Maybe our hypothesis is confirmed, maybe it needs to be changed a little bit based on, on what we've seen. But what's important to note about this is what can we know? What can science tell us um, about reality, about the universe, about the world that we live in? Uh, it can tell us about anything that, that can fit in here, right? Anything which can be um, which I can develop a testable prediction for, which I can empirically observe and study and gather data on, something that exists concretely in the material world. Uh, that includes things which I can't see, right? It includes things like sub subatomic particles or fields, uh, gravity, right, which I can't see but I can observe the effects of, I can observe its interaction with other particles, with other things in the world. So it's not just necessarily what I can see and touch, right? But in some way, I'm able to measure either directly or indirectly. It's something, uh, things that exert some kind of consistent um, force on other objects. There's a consistent interaction in the material world that I can observe. So it's helpful for answering questions like, what is this thing? Uh, how does it work? How does it interact with other things that are in the world? I think it's important to note then what can't science tell us about the world. Um, it can't tell us about things that don't fit in this picture, things that aren't empirically observable and testable about which I can gather data or see interactions with other things in the physical world. So if it doesn't fall in this category, it doesn't, it's not something that I can really study under this method. Now, this is where many people will say, well, then it's not worth knowing, mm. or it doesn't exist, right? Make, make that immediate uh, conclusion. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but that's moving beyond the realm of science, which is based on this method, uh, and moving into philosophical speculation, and actually unfounded philosophical speculation, if you want my opinion. But, um, so it, can, it can, can tell us about things that are in the world, but uh, not about things that are not material, um, that don't have consistent <clears throat> patterns of interaction with other material things. Uh, it can't answer questions about meaning or purpose, uh, although it can give some insight into our search for meaning and purpose. It can't by itself answer those questions, uh, because Meaning and purpose are not empirically observable realities in the world. So, or about any invisible realities which don't exert consistent, um, consistent forces on <coughs> other objects around them. 
for example, uh, a spiritual reality like the soul, or like an angel, uh, something that's not, not physically testable or empirically observable. Okay. There's been, um, recently, there's been a kind of a flurry of, of books and articles and YouTube videos and etc. about uh, that tries to reduce everything or tries to explain everything in scientific, largely biological terms. Um, the most well-known example of that is probably The Selfish Gene, which is a book by Richard Dawkins, who has made, uh, made a name for himself by combating religion, especially Christianity, and making all kinds of claims about how science proves that, that God doesn't exist. Um, so books like this, like The Selfish Gene, try to explain every part of human experience, including things like purpose or meaning or ethics, in terms of biological realities, uh, like largely for Richard Dawkins, evolution. Um, evolutionary theory, <coughs> excuse me, uh, fitness and some of the other categories which drive evolution are able to explain everything about my life, my experience, everything that I see and interact with in the biological world, uh, what we would call mind, right, or free will, or desire, or morality, any of these kind of things can be explained by genetics, essentially. Uh, now, I think most of you probably agree that that's an artificially reductive way of looking at the world and of looking at the human person. I think it's important to note that biology, sure, has a lot to tell us that can help us understand things like desire and morality and free will. But it by itself is not capable uh, of totally explaining those things without giving a really small and reductive description of, of the actual reality. Often, um, this kind of a project, like what Richard Dawkins and others tried to do, it can describe the reality and maybe it can, can paint a picture that, oh, okay, yeah, I can see how, uh, how genetics could, could play a role here, could influence um, you know, human morality and the development of desire or the, the development of, you know, let's say, like altruism, right, and, and desiring to protect the, your offspring, it's, you're protecting the genes that, that it, you've handed on, right? Um, there are ways that certainly there could be an influence there, but the approach is based on an a priori assumption that the only thing that matters is evolutionary fitness. So, yeah. Definition a priori. Oh yeah, a priori uh, and as a starting point, without any, any <coughs> reason, any evidence to to back it up, but sort of an unfounded starting point assumption um, without experience to say that, well, evolutionary fitness is the only uh, category that really matters when we're trying to explain things in the world and in human experience. Thank you. Uh, there's, there's a great book um, by an atheist philosopher, actually, all, maybe more of an agnostic. He's, I don't know that he's quite sure what he is, uh, named Thomas Nagel called Mind and Cosmos, and the subtitle of the book is something like why the neo-Darwinian uh, materialistic view of the universe is certainly false, or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty bold title, but, uh, but this is just a little quote from his book, uh, sort of responding to folks like Dawkins who try to reduce everything to ter into genetic terms. He says, it would be an advance of the secular theoretical establishment could wean itself of the materialism and Darwinism of the gaps to adapt one of its own pejorative tags. This view is a heroic triumph of ideological theory over common sense. Uh, perhaps you've heard the phrase God of the gaps, which theists uh, are often accused of <coughs> explaining problems away by saying, well, it's because it's God. Uh, we, we don't know how things developed the way that it did. God explains everything that I can't really explain um, scientifically. Now, what, what Nagel is pointing out here is saying, actually this is a pretty common approach in, uh, in the secular world, saying, well, I don't really have all the answers for how this works, but evolution. Uh, evolutionary fitness is, is the, 
the magic key which unlocks every door of, of interpretation. So both of those views are unhelpful and they don't help us, they don't really get at what's going on in reality, which is often a much more complex integration of spiritual and material realities um, where science and religion have a lot to contribute. One a great example of that, uh, as I, I, I kind of mentioned already, is ethics, um, morality. Now it's, it's, it's worth asking the question, is it possible to really give a full account of, of morality um, just on a biological basis? Is it possible to give a, a full account of morality without God? Often uh, you, you hear that question asked, like, can, can we be good without God? Is there any reason to be good without God? And I've heard, and I cringe when I hear this, but I've heard well-meaning Christians respond by saying, well, no, I mean, if there was, you know, if there was no God, then I'd have no reason to be moral to, or to do, to do the right thing. It's only, be, only because God exists that I, I feel compelled to do so. And what they're trying to do is point to, therefore, there must be a God, um, because I feel this compulsion, but it comes off as, well, so you'd be just a, a, a complete, completely depraved and base individual if it wasn't for this fear of God punishing you kind of thing. So it's not the most helpful apologetic approach. Um, but I think, actually, a better way of asking that question is, we have this deep, felt instinct towards goodness. And we disagree sometimes about how to apply those principles, but everyone agrees that we should choose good and not evil, right? Uh, okay, why is that the case? Where does that come from? What is that rooted in? Uh, C.S. Lewis, I think I have this. Yeah. A little bit of a long quote from C.S. Lewis. This is from Mere Christianity, um, which is certainly worth your time if you haven't read it already. C.S. Lewis says, I only ask the reader to think what a totally different morality would mean. Think of a country where people were admired for running away in battle, where a man felt proud of double-crossing all the people who had been kindness to him. You might as well imagine a country in where two and two made five. Men have differed as regards what people you ought to be unselfish to, whether it was only your own family or your fellow countrymen or everyone. But they have always agreed that you ought not to put yourself first. Selfishness has never been admired. Men have differed as to whether you should have one wife or four, but they have always agreed that you must not simply have any woman you liked. Right, so there's this, there's this deep, felt human instinct of, of morality. Uh, even being able to look at something and say, that's bad, that's evil. Right? There's some kind of basis for that. Um, one of the, ironically, one of the things that people will often point to as the reason they don't believe in God is, well, how can I believe in a good God when there's so much evil in the world? That's a fair question, and we need to, um, to deal with, you know, why would God allow evil to exist? But, to take a step back, there's, there's an atheistic problem of evil as well, not just a theistic one. Uh, how can I call this evil? On what basis do you call this evil? If it's, well, this isn't convenient for me, or isn't something that's according to my liking, well, not, that's not actually what people are saying. They're saying, no, there's something fundamentally about this that's not the way that it's supposed to be. It's uh, whether you want to call it unfair or unjust or whatever. But there's an emission of some kind of objective standard. And again, how that, those principles get applied isn't always the same, and there's some disagreement about that. But, but there's a clear sense that... Uh, there's, there's something here which uh, allows me to recognize a distinction between good and evil, and I'm driven towards good. I don't think there's a way to explain that in simply biological terms or in simply genetic terms. Um, in fact, actually, if we're looking at it in terms of evolutionary fitness, there are a number of things like altruism, acts of unselfishness, uh, or this, this last line here, um, you can differ as to whether you have one wife or four, but they have always agreed you must not simply have any, any woman you liked. Well, that's a, a universally held moral principle that's actually 
pretty against what might be considered evolutionary fitness if the goal is is the the propagation of 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 the species and, and handing on your genes, so to speak, uh, it's not really a good biological way to explain some of these principles of morality. I think Kyle, yes. you've used that term, evolutionary fitness, several times. Yeah, sorry. Could you expound mm -hmm. on that a little bit, what you mean? One of the basic principles of evolution is that what drives evolution, so the, the way that, that species change over time, is their fitness for life. So. Uh, their healthiness, their ability to continue to survive in a difficult environment and to be able to reproduce. Um, so a, a species, a, an organism that's more fit um, has an evolutionary advantage and is going to be able to, to hand on its genes, so to speak, its genetic or ministerial will, will continue. Um, so thank you, good question. So is it like survival of the fittest? Survival of the fittest, okay. exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so so there's there's these there's these aspects of human experience, morality, ethics being one of them, which we have to we have to ask the question: uh, Can science, according to this method, uh, can science tell me everything I need to know to really make sense of my human experience in this? And I, I think I think the answer is no. There are there are a few folks like Richard Dawkins who will really try to to shove morality into, um, into a corner to make it fit in their evolutionary box, but I, I don't think it does, and I think it does an injustice both to science and to ethics as well. Okay. I have something. Yes. Can you go back to the last slide really fast? Yeah. So, um, the, so the, they, but they have always agreed that you ought not to put yourself first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you are thinking about evolution and the scientific approach, so my question, like the question that pops up in my head was, well, to be in a community and kind to your fellows and that quote unquote, like what we call good to mm -hmm. other people could have been a survival instinct. Sure. You know, so that could, you know, that fear could be, mm -hmm. I don't know, that's what, that's the question that I sure. think. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that makes a lot of sense that someone who is always, in, any organism, whether it's a human being or an animal or something, who's always antagonizing, isn't going to do well in any community, right? Uh, it's, that's not, that's not enhancing your evolutionary fitness, so, um, so yeah, and so I think it's I think it's important to recognize there actually are are ways that we can see, huh? You, you can see how evolution might have had a, had a positive influence in this. Um, I certainly don't want to say that science has nothing, biology has nothing to contribute to morality, and the only way of understanding it is the Bible or something like that. Um, but but I do think it's the case that we can't simply reduce it to to things that are. Uh, to, to biological factors, so, yeah, Thank you. yeah, that's a good question. Okay, okay, so remembering that all of this is in the context of what can science tell us and what can science not tell us about reality. Uh, there's a lot of things that it can tell us according to the scientific method. There's other other things that it seems like questions of meaning and purpose, morality, for example, that it can't give a full account of. Which, is, again, is not to say that it doesn't have anything to contribute, but it can't give a full account of. Um, one, of the, one of the books that I've been reading kind of in preparation for this, which I'd highly recommend, by Alvin Plantinga. Um, I'm going to have to go to the last slide because I can't remember the name of it right now. There we go. Where the Conflict Really Lies, Science, Religion, and Naturalism, by Alvin Plantinga. Really good book. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show this again at the end. but. A hard read. He's a, I mean, he's an academic philosopher. So, if you're into that, it's worth your effort. But um, it's a hard read, just FYI. Where the conflict lies, uh, this this presumption that the conflict is between science and religion, Plantinga actually, and we'll go get to this a little bit later on, says it's not between science and religion. It's between 
evolutionary science and what you call metaphysical naturalism, which is this presumption that um, the only things which exist are things in the natural world and the laws of nature which, which govern them. Um, but Plantinga says in this book that it's silly to suggest that we don't need, that because we have modern science, we don't need any other sources of knowledge, like philosophy or religion or literature or whatever. He says, that's like claiming that now that we have refrigerators and chainsaws and roller skates, we no longer have need for Mozart. It's sort of like, well, yeah, that's, that's a clear non sequitur, but, uh, but that is a very common way of thinking. Uh, not described in that way, but it's a very common way of thinking in the modern world is that, you know, I, actually we've got, I've got iPhones and, um, you know, and self-driving cars and all this other crazy stuff, but what do I need God for? Um, what do I need morality for? So. Um, okay, let's keep moving here. Uh, okay, religion. <clears throat> We're defining our terms. That, that's all the science part. Religion. Uh, what can religion tell us about? Okay, pretty obviously God. Um, spiritual realities, it can help us get at questions of meaning and purpose and morality, certainly. Uh, it can answer questions about why things exist or um, personhood, right? Who instead of just what? Uh, who is God? What can we know about God? How has God revealed himself to us? Now remember, what science can tell us is based on this method in which things can be observed and tested and repeated, etc. Uh, God is not a thing in, this, in the world that can be poked and prodded and observed and manipulated and tested. Uh, so simply by the definition of what science is and what it's able to study, it actually can't tell us about the existence of God, for or against, right? Um, that's not to say that God can't exist, or to say that, well, he must exist. It's just to say, actually, science doesn't have a whole lot to say about that question itself, which is not to say that it can't give us evidence which can help us understand whether or not there's, there's good reasons to believe that God exists. Certainly it can. Uh, one of those is, for example, there's a lot of scientific methods of reading the scriptures that have come more into use in the last two or three hundred years, which have been a huge source of, of wealth and knowledge uh, for interpreting what the Bible is actually trying to tell us. There's a lot of value there. But it's not um, in itself able to tell me about an invisible reality. It can tell me about things in the material world, which God is not. He's not an observable being in the material world. He's actually not even a thing uh, in the strictest sense of the word. He is being itself. Uh, God is not one being among, among many other beings. He's not just the biggest one. He's kind of like us, except for, um, you know, invisible and like way bigger and way smarter and way kinder and etc. Uh, no, he's being itself. He is the, the very active to be, if you want to get into it. Thomas Aquinas has a lot, a lot to say about that. But, but it's an important distinction to make. Uh, I exist because I've received <coughs> existence from my parents, most directly, and then from their parents, and their parents, and their parents, ultimately um, back to, to the beginning, to God. God exists, period. It's, his, it's who he is. It's his essence to exist. Uh, he's not one being that exists in a world amongst many others. When God uh, appears to Moses, he says to him, I am who am. I'm the one who is. It's my very nature to be. That's who I am. Uh, so Moses is trying to ask God, hey, I'm going to go tell the people that God wants to, to rescue them from slavery, and they're going to say, okay, which God? Right? Because there's tons, tons of gods in, in the world at the time. Which God? Uh, is this one we know? Is this one we want to follow or not? And he says, I am. I'm, I'm the God who is. I'm not one among many. I'm not, I'm not one amongst all the Egyptian and Babylonian and etc. gods, right? I, I am. 
from the source of all that is. So God and everything else that in any way exists are not on the same playing field, not on the same ontological playing field, so to speak. Uh, great, there's a great symbol of this that happens in the same incident with Moses, right? The bush, which burns, but is not consumed. So God, because he is, because he is existence itself, and he's not just one being in the world amongst many others who's, who's competing against others for resources and for, for honor and for glory and whatever, uh, doesn't need to destroy by coming, when he comes in and, and takes his place and has his way with things, right? He, he's able to be present and actually make something more glorious without destroying it. The existence that we have, the life that we have, the very fact that we exist, we receive from him. Out of his goodness. Uh, many of the new atheist arguments against the existence of God have way too small of a view of who God is. They, they view God as a thing in the world. They view him as the biggest thing, um, but just one among many beings that exist in the world. Uh, and therefore, it's, if that's the case, it's difficult to answer questions uh, like the problem of evil. Uh, it's difficult to, to understand how it might be the case that this whole process of evolution could have happened uh, over billions of years, if your image of God is, is some kind of thing who's just sticking his hand in and manipulating things here and there. But if, if he is, gives existence to everything that is, then the way that God's providence can carry itself out throughout the years, throughout history, can happen in a way that, that's much more subtle um, and that doesn't involve sort of violent interaction or this, the changing, manipulating the way things are. Um, but God, while allowing the laws of nature to have their effect, and while allowing things like human freedom uh, to continue, can still, in providence, carry out his will uh, as time goes on. Okay, that's getting us far afield maybe, sorry, but um, God is not a thing in the world who can be observed and poked and prodded by science and by definition is not uh, testable by the scientific method. Yeah. Um, would it be fair to say that science is like a tool, it's one tool among several that we have uh, to understand reality, and that if you're going to investigate something, then you need to use the right tool. Yes. Is someone like Dawkins is probably looking at it like this. Someone said that if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem be resembles a nail. Yeah, right. That's great. I like that a lot. It's a great analogy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And um, you can hit it with a hammer as much as you want, but it's actually it's still not quite going to fit in, in the way that you want if what you're dealing with is, is a screw and not a nail. Um, so, again, I think it's important to recognize, yeah, that it's good to have the full toolbox in our arsenal. Otherwise, there's going to be some projects that we're not going to be able to complete. There's going to be realities that we're not going to understand fully. Um, and there's a lot of ways, and this, again, more of this will be next week when we start to look at things about like evolution and creation and the first chapters of Genesis. There's a lot of ways in which science has been very helpful in biblical interpretation because it's helped us understand what the Bible's not saying, right? It's not saying that uh, it was created in six, the whole universe was created in six 24-hour days, right? Let's, uh, we'll leave that for, for next week, right? But, um, but, but it can help us get at what the Bible is actually saying by bracketing off some things that it's, that it's not saying. Um, yeah. You're, you're kind of repeating Aquinas' idea here that God is being itself. Yes. Uh, but I've, I've never really been able to understand the word being in that phrase other than this incomprehensible abstraction. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless you go to 
the word existence as a synonym for being. Mm -hmm. is, is that what you're suggesting, or can you explain what this being is? Yeah. Means? Um, well, I, I would refer you to smarter people than me to answer this question, but here's, here's why I attempt at it. Um, I think that's a fair equivalence, being in existence. I think that's a fair equivalence, uh, especially when we're looking at things like us. Um, maybe you could say that being is sort of the active force, right, by, by which... By, by which things exist, which causes things to exist. Um, for God, he, his, his essence, like what he is, is the same as his existence, that he is. Again, so God exists, I am who I am. For us, um, yeah, I think, I think that's a fair, that's a fair uh, comparison. I guess I'd understand being in a more active sense, if that makes sense. Existence is sort of a largely understood as a brute fact. Um, it, either it is or it isn't. Being seems to have a more active connotation. But either way, if you're talking about a fair equivalence mm -hmm. between God being existence, then it seems you're running pretty close to uh, yeah. pantheism. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That's an interesting question because. Uh, I remember, so I had, for, for a Doctor of God class, I had now Bishop Robert Barron, actually, as my professor, so I was pretty fortunate. Uh, and he, it was interesting, I remember him saying something like, Aquinas' understanding of who God is, especially in relation to creation, uh, is about as close to pantheism as you can get without being pantheism. Um, it's, it's clearly not pantheism, because that's to say that everything is God, right? Uh, we're all kind of subsumed into this one large blob of being that is God. And that's clearly not Christian teaching. Um, but what he, what he meant to say by saying it's, it's close to pantheism without being pantheism is that the reality of everything that does exist exists because it's received its existence from God and in some way participates uh, in, in God's being, right? If, God is the only thing that necessarily exists, and everything else that exists only exists because he chooses to, to, to bring it into existence and sustain it in existence. Uh, otherwise, I would cease to exist right now if, if God wasn't sustaining me in existence. So there's this active sense, which you can understand how it could be confused with pantheism. There's this active sense in which uh, God is sustaining me in existence, and I'm... I'm I'm kind of always in relationship to him just by existing. There's actually a beautiful spiritual principle there, right? That, uh, that is the ontological expression of what, when St. Paul says, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, you know, what can separate us from, from the love of God? And the only reason I exist is because he continues to hold me in existence. Um, and then, in relation to that, something like sin, the rejection of God is, it's not just, oops, I did something that was bad, but it's, that's a rejection of, of the deepest level of my being, of who I am, um, in relation to God. So, anyway. Taking us far afield here, but good questions. Okay, uh, let's bring it back to science and religion. Uh, so, so those are the two kind of spheres, right? Spheres of, of knowledge, science and religion, and what they can know about reality, what they can help us understand about reality. Um, but I want to look a little bit at where there's some real agreement, where there's some real concord, where there's congruence between these two, two spheres of knowledge. Uh, great book that I really recommend by John Polkinghorne, who is actually a, a quantum physicist who became an Anglican priest, called Theology in the Context of Science, that, that looks a lot at a lot of these areas of overlap. Uh, this is really eye-opening for me, a lot of these things. So, he says, revelation, that is, what we know about God, what God has revealed to us about himself, is experiential rather than propositional. It's a lot more like a lab notebook of data than it is uh, a set of 
of principles or laws. I think that's, that's, that's really insightful. So when we look at what God has revealed about himself in the scriptures, what we're looking at is the experience of God of, that people have had over a period of thousands of years. So, and certainly that experience is inspired and guided by the Holy Spirit and has been handed on to us so that we might know what God has revealed about himself through that, uh, through that experience. Um, but if we look at, for example, science, when it, it looks at subatomic particles, we can't see electrons or quarks or whatever. Uh, we have good reasons for thinking that they exist and that what, what we've heard about them is true because of they make sense of a lot of experience. They make sense of a lot of studies of experiments that have been done uh, that say, hmm, there seems to be some really, really infinitesimally small particle that's negatively charged, that's interacting with these positively charged um, nucleus of this atom, right? I can't see it, but based on, on the data, based on experience, this makes, a, makes sense of a whole lot of it. Uh, similarly, when we look at the experience of God, theologically what we teach, it's because it makes sense of a lot of experience of God that's been handed down to us, especially um, in the inspiring text of Scripture. Uh, so one of the things that Polkinghorne says, says is, Theology knows, owes science no apology for its belief in the unseen reality of God. For that belief serves to make sense of great swaths of spiritual experience, just as belief in electrons and protons and quarks makes sense of great swaths of, of scientific data and experience. So the approach for both science and religion in some ways is, is a critical... Uh, a critical realism, right? I, I want to know what, how things really are, and based on my analysis of the data, based on my analysis of, of experience, um, critical analysis of that data, uh, that's, that's how I arrive at an under understanding of the way that things actually are. Um, what do you mean by critical analysis? So, <clears throat> not, not taking things um, at first glance, right? So uh, it took a long, long time for scientists to really, and you could say maybe they're still working on it, to really understand the structure of the atom. And there were lots of uh, models that were proposed that seemed to kind of make things right, but not quite. Uh, or you could say the orbit of the planets is another good example of that. That went through several iterations before finally they were able to calculate um, so, so critically looking at that and saying, okay, that's kind of close, but no, actually, we want to we wanna pursue this deeper. We want to, and that's a great example of that theologically is looking at some of the mysteries of what God has revealed himself, like the Trinity or the, the human and divine natures of Christ. The first 450 years of, of the church's life was this back and forth about uh, who is God, actually. Uh, you know, there's plenty of good reasons for thinking that God is Trinitarian in the Bible itself, but it's not like immediately obvious. But that was hammered out over, over a series of, of hundreds of years with lots of heresies, with lots of wrong <coughs> models for understanding who Jesus is, how, how Jesus can be both human and divine. Um, until finally, of course, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, arriving at a deeper understanding of who God is and what he's revealing about himself in the text of scripture. Um, so critical analysis would be asking more questions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, not being not being content with superficial uh, understanding, but yeah, asking, asking more questions, which is exactly what science does, which is <coughs> exactly what theology does. Um, and the reason we can still continue to do science is because we don't have all of the laws of the universe figured out. The reason we can still do theology is because we don't have, we don't know everything that there is to know about who God is. We've got some scientific laws that then provide a basis for future knowledge. We've got a lot of dogma in theology, which provides a basis for future theological investigation, uh, but we don't know everything. Yeah, so I, I think it's just 
it's important to affirm that theology and science are both seeking motivated beliefs about reality. They're both, both seeking beliefs which have good reasons for them, that are actually based on evidence. Now, the question then comes in, what evidence, what kind of evidence are we accepting? Um, if there's, if there's a, a basic assumption that the only kind of evidence I'll accept is what can be empirically measured, that's when you get a lot of people saying, well, the God just doesn't exist. And we would say, well, that's, that's the wrong image of God. That's not who he is. Um, yeah. There's, there's some great, uh, I'll let Paulo get more into this next week, but John Paul II has a lot of good things to say about evolution. But just re-emphasizing kind of at the bottom here, a lot of these realities, uh, metaphysics, self-consciousness, awareness, morality, free will, etc., beauty, um, we need philosophical reflection on these things to understand what they really mean. Um, a simple biological, scientific basis is, is not enough. Uh, one of the things that I think is worth pointing out um, for folks who are skeptical about the congruence that exists between religion and science is just to look at some of the famous names in science over, the, over history, uh, many of whom are priests and religious. <coughs> so Roger Bacon, Nicholas Copernicus, Gregor Mendel, uh, George Lemaitre, one of my favorites actually because he's the, the, the first one to propose the Big Bang Theory. Uh, was a priest. John Polkinghorne, who I mentioned his book earlier, um, was a theoretical physicist and one of the discoverers of the quark, who's now an Anglican priest. So uh, these folks didn't seem to, to think that there was any disagreement. Um, there's actually a Wikipedia page, which we don't need to look at in detail, but I was kind of surprised by this list of Catholic clergy scientists, and it's not a short one. I mean, there's, there's quite a few names. So that's for your browsing pleasure later on. Take a break now. And yes. Yes, I think that'd be perfect. Great. I'm gonna need a break.
back, back in action here. Um, all right, so just two, two more things I want to do briefly. Based on kind of everything that's, that's been said here about, the, about science and religion in their respective ways that we can know things, to make a distinction between science and scientism. Uh, science is science. That's what we know science to be. It's the, it's the way of study, think, studying things through the scientific method. Scientism is actually a philosophical position, uh, which, which is held by, uh, something like this would be held by a lot of folks like Richard Dawkins and some of the new atheists, who would say that anything that we can know is, is reducible to what we can know through science. Or the only things that we can know is reducible to what we can know through scientific investigation. Um, so, first, science. Uh, science is the, the possibility of doing science is based on looking at things the way that they actually are um, and observing how things interact without assuming that there's something else going on. Um, if I see something interacting and happening in the physical world, and my, my first assumption that when, I, when I, I drop this cup and it falls to the ground, oh, it's because God swatted it and knocked it to the ground, that's not very good science. And that's not actually going to help me understand the way that reality works. So science uh, kind of has as, a, as a, an assumption what you can call methodological naturalism, so naturalism is, is essentially the, the philosophical view that um, that's, limits things to what we can know of nature, uh, of what exists in the, the natural world, the material world, as governed by natural, the natural laws of physics. Methodological naturalism is just basically saying, as part of this method of in investigating the natural world, I'm assuming that what I'm seeing is based on the interaction of things in the natural world, without outside intervention of something like God or an angel or some spiritual reality. That's how you do science. I mean, that's normal. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think it's important to note that that kind of study of the natural world presumes that there's an order in the world itself which can be understood. Um, things make sense. There are laws. There is consistency. The universe is intelligible. And if that were not the case, there'd be no point in trying to study it and understand it, right? This is a fundamental part of the Catholic theology of creation. Creation is everything that exists is made in an ordered way. And the structure of the first part of Genesis really demonstrates that, right? It's very systematic of the first day and the second day and the third day. Um, God made things in an ordered way and in a way that we can understand. Uh, they're intelligible to us. So, methodological naturalism uh, seeks to observe what is empirically knowable and experiment on what can actually be known according just to scientific methods. And it's totally compatible with belief in God. No, it's not a bad thing. It's just good science. It's how you do science. Uh, metaphysical naturalism or philosophical naturalism, sometimes it, it takes on other names. Um, it's not really good philosophy or good science. Uh, it's not really science at all, actually. This is a philosophical assumption that because I can only study and observe things that are in the natural world, those must be the only things which exist. Those must be, must be the only things that, uh, that I can have any kind of knowledge of. So it takes a priori, like before, before experience, it takes as this unproved assumption that because science can't study something, uh, it doesn't exist. So whether that's um, desire or morality or intention or mind or spirit or whatever. Yes? Aristotle's metaphysics, I bet you do that. Uh, in, what, in what sense? I mean, wait, the, word, the term metaphysics, metaphysical, uh -huh. the section of Aristotle's philosophy, right. is, is that Met metaphysics. Bad science as well? Aristotle is bad science? No, no, met the word metaphysics is it's not a bad word. Uh, okay. Metaphysics just means, it actually means after physics. So in Aristotle's corpus of writing, there was the book on physics, and then the next book was called Metaphysics because it was the book after physics. 
but it uh, generally means non non physical realities, uh, things that are not material or visible in that way. So that would include things like being God, um, and it would point towards things like you know ethics and morality, etc. But um, metaphysics is not a bad word. It's actually quite a good word. Uh, metaphysical naturalism is saying the only thing that exists, like the, the, the fundamental basis of, of existence and reality, is only what's natural, only what's material, uh, only the things that are in the physical world, right? Uh, one of the unfortunate consequences of metaphysical or philosophical naturalism <coughs> is that it's self-contradictory. Uh, if the assumption is that the only things that exist are things which are um, observable and provable by the scientific method, that statement itself is not observable or provable by the scientific method. Uh, it's, a, it's an assumed starting point, um, which was really without reason, right? So it's, it's, there's an irony there, certainly, and I think it's worth noting that, okay, uh, this that isn't, isn't really very firmly rooted. Um, okay, so is that distinction clear? Like, so the, the word naturalism is not necessarily bad, and it's not bad when you're doing science to to set God aside methodologically. That is to say, of course, we never do anything apart from God, right? But I'm not going to assume that the first explanation for what I see going on uh, is God's direct intervention. Is scientism almost like making a religion out of science? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wait for the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great, great. It's like you read the book. <laughs> yeah, it, that, that's almost exactly what it is. Um, so going back to this book by Alvin Plantinga that I mentioned at the beginning, which the title always escapes me, Where the Conflict Really Lies, Science, Religion, and Naturalism. Um, towards the end of it, he lays out an argument against this metaphysical naturalism um, based on moder the modern science of evolution. So we'll just step through this real quickly and then we'll I want to finish up so we have some more time for questions and such. Um, so this is the argument. If unguided evolution, right, evolution completely just according to the, the laws of nature as such, assuming that there's nothing like God, and metaphysical naturalism are both true, our cognitive faculties are not likely to be reliable. Um, and here's how he kind of argues for this. Natural selection is based on, uh, it's interested in adaptive behavior, not true belief necessarily. It's based on giving me an evolutionary advantage, increasing my, my fitness for survival, not on whether or not I know the right answer to a question. And I think that's especially true when it comes to abstract knowledge. There's really no evolutionary advantage uh, to knowing abstract truths. Um, certainly there is an advantage, evolutionary advantage, for being able to see re reality more or less as it is. Right? If, if I think, uh, you know, if, if there's a tiger over there that wants to eat me, and I think it's a, a teddy bear, I'm like, let's that's not going to give me an evolutionary advantage. Uh, it would help, be helpful to have an accurate perception of that reality. But especially with abstract, more abstract realities, math, physics, philosophy, it's, it's, it's difficult to see how there would be an evolutionary advantage to having true belief in those areas. It's, I mean, it's at best 50-50. I mean, it's at best a toss-up, but really it doesn't seem like there'd be any direct evolutionary advantage there. So, let me just go on to say, if I believe both evolution, right, this un unguided evolution, and metaphysical naturalism, I have a good reason to doubt my own intuition that my cognitive faculties are reliable, because natural select selection doesn't select for accuracy in cognitive faculties. It selects for evolutionary fitness, evolutionary advantage. Therefore, I have a defeater. A defeater just means I'm basically saying reason to doubt um, the reliability of my cognitive faculty, of my intellect. 
Um, so there, there really is, there does seem to be a conflict between the proposal that everything has come about, especially the human being and the human mind, have come about strictly by unguided evolution um, and metaphysical naturalism. Right. So, so to your point here, Kurt, the, this is the last so spoiler alert. This is kind of the, the way that planning ends the book. Given that naturalism is at least a quasi-religion, there is indeed a science-religion conflict. But it's not between science and theistic religion. It's between science and naturalism. That's where the conflict really lies. So uh, there's deep concord between religion and science. There's deep concord between a God who created an ordered world that we can study and understand um, and our ability to know that world. There's, you can poke holes in this argument and it's not perfect, but he raises a fair point to say there's not really a great reason to necessarily think um, that my knowledge of abstract things is reliable if evolution is this totally unguided process. Deep concord between science and religion. There's there's some issues um, when it comes to metaphysical naturalism, and that is this assumption that only the natural world exists um, and modern evolutionary science. And I don't think I don't think we want to jettison modern evolutionary study and science. I certainly don't. So this is. Uh, this is the way that, that Plantinga kind of wraps up this argument. And I think hopefully what the, the main takeaway that for, for me would be to recognize that there's a lot of good reasons um, to say that science and religion are both important and we need both of them. And we need to we need access to as much knowledge about the world from as many angles as possible if we're really gonna understand. Uh, everything about the world in which we live that God has created. So, questions? Yeah. That quote, is that the last line of his book? I'm pretty sure it's the last line of the book. It's on the last page, if I'm not mistaken. So, so yeah, sorry if I gave everything away. It's, like I said, it's a good read. Uh, I think he was a, he was a professor at Calvin for a while. You're going to have and then I ended up at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. He's still, he's still reformed, though. Uh-huh. Any questions? You know, about things that we've talked about kind of in the abstract, or just maybe any questions about how to respond to uh, arguments that you've heard? Um, you seem to be saying that true belief is your is irrelevant if you follow that line of thinking. Wouldn't an accurate understanding of the reality around you give you a survival yeah. advantage? Certainly. I, I certainly think it would. Uh, I think it's more problematic. I don't think, I, I definitely agree that that's the case. I don't think there's any reason to think that abstract knowledge um, that is knowledge not just of how do I interact with the things in the world around me in a, in a helpful way, but abstract knowledge like um, math or physics or philosophy or even study of something like the principles of evolution. Um, there's not really any reason to think that knowing the principles of evolution gives me an evolutionary advantage, right? So. Uh, I don't. I don't think this argument is perfect. I don't. I don't think it's like a knock down, drag out argument, but but I do think it raises a really important question, uh, and and ought to make us look at a place where there there really might be some conflicts between um, between metaphysical naturalism and and modern science. Things which unfortunately tend to go together and ought not to. So that's really what I'm suggesting, is especially with everything that um, modern science, uh, under really metaphysical naturalism under the guise of modern science, does to, to try to poke holes in religious belief um, 
I think it's important for us to recognize both that there's good reasons to believe in, in, in the deep congruence between science and religion, but also to recognize that actually this, this assumption um, that only the natural world exists isn't really well-founded in science. I saw a uh, television program that really blew me away uh, back however many months ago. Because, I mean, I always had this notion that, although they call it the theory of evolution, that it was pretty much accepted as, mm -hmm. as fact. Yeah. But, in this program, they came out with the idea that if, indeed, evolution is accurate, okay, that that idea is accurate, that there should be fossil evidence <clears throat> Um, of showing uh, species developing yeah. the into other yeah, into yeah. other species, species yeah. and uh, I guess Darwin himself in his books indicated that that he couldn't find any such evidence at that time, but that he felt sure that evidence would be found, mm -hmm. and apparently, at least according to the guys that made this program, there has never been any conclusive evidence found regarding that, which, you know, makes evolution now even, you know, suspect scientifically, if you will. Yeah, there, I think there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of room for argument, just on a strictly scientific level, about to what extent evolution explains uh, organisms as we see them today. I mean, it, it seems, it's certainly the case that evolution on a small scale um, approach makes a lot of sense. If you've got white rabbits and brown rabbits in Antarctica, uh, brown rabbits are going to get selected out pretty quickly. Um, they're a lot more visible to polar bears, right? So, so there's, there's a clear, um, I mean, there are, there's areas where the theory just makes a lot of sense. Can it explain going from a single cell bacteria to this, that's, that's a bigger question. Um, I'm not super familiar with all the archaeological evidence about some of the transitional forms that, that there's, there's been modifications to, to the theory over time. There's the, the more, one of the more recent ones is called punctuated equi equilibrium. So there's this uh, idea that there were these rapid kind of accelerated periods of evolution um, based on real intense pressures on a, on a, on a community. Um, and that's why you maybe don't see the gr real gradualism that you might expect in the fossil record or in some of these, yeah, that, that kind of slow transition. Um, I, at the end of the day, I think the great thing for us as Catholics is, is we, can, we can look look at as science um, does its work in this area and, and look back and say, great, awesome, um, glad we're figuring some of these things out. There's nothing really in there that fundamentally shakes my, my belief in any way. Um, to what extent, I mean, this is, stay tuned for part two because this is, this is really what we're going to be getting into next week is, is evolution and creation. Um, so I, I want to say to you, your thunder, Pablo, but there's, uh, there's nothing there that, that fundamentally shakes my belief in anything that's, that's that I believe about Catholic theology. Other questions? Awesome. Well, good. Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, thank you so much for, for coming. Um, just some comments for next week. We've talked a lot about just kind of the bigger ideas, a lot of the philosophy. Um, but when we talk about God as being, that's true, but does that really speak of the God that we worship in liturgy? Does that really speak of the God that we pray to? So there's other questions like, what does it mean to believe in a personal God? Uh, what does it mean to uh, believe in the purpose of the world? And then um, to really dive into what is kind of the universe and evolution, those sorts of questions. So. Um, I'm going to dive into that next week on um, in part two.
and then we'll, uh, we'll live stream it as well. Um, and if you have any other questions, please, uh, please email the, the CIC office, or you can find my email online um, on the CIC website. Let me know, and hopefully I can tailor the presentation to any questions um, that you might have or that other people might present to you. So will Father Kyle be here next week? Okay. Yeah, and, and I'd be happy to, if you want to shoot me an email um, in the future, you can get in touch with Pablo and he'll have it, or just go St. Francis in Holland on the website there, you'll be able to find it. So I'd be happy to take any follow-up questions or anything or point you towards some additional resources. Oh, I promised I was going to show this at the end too, so some good stuff there. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming, and uh, have a good night. Can you, uh, Father, can you